thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Um, so, welcome uh, from my side as well. Um, I'm Frank Tisches, as Michel already announced, from Leipzig University. And I would kindly ask uh, Mustafa to set up uh, his presentation um, while I'm uh, shortly introducing him. So, Mustafa um, has uh, studied at Monash University in Australia and uh, did there already deal with uh, biotechnological applications of a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And uh, this is the, uh, apparently the great topic of his career. So since then he has worked at different places in academia and interest industry. Uh, among, um, the, um, among them are companies at Varian or Agilent Technologies. And through all of that, uh, he's dealt with uh, FTIR microscopy essentially and imaging. And um, now he's uh, the director of product management and marketing at a company which was already announced earlier uh, during this webinar series uh, by Yi Jing Cheng, uh, which is photothermal spectroscopy um, uh, corporation uh, situated in California and Santa Barbara. And um, we invited uh, Mustafa to uh, present the developments which are made there um, in uh, the product, finally, uh, MIRH IR microscope, uh, which also has other features. So uh, please uh, welcome Mustafa. Um, the stage is uh, yours, or the screen is yours, essentially. Thank you, Frank. Uh, just before I start, just want to make sure that you're seeing the right screen. Uh, yes, into we do. screen mode. Yeah, okay. we do. Thank you. Everything's perfect. All right, excellent. All right, well, um, I'm going to jump straight into it. So thank you for the intro and, and thank you for the opportunity for uh, coming in here and, and, and telling you a little bit about what we do at, at, at PSC, at Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp. Uh, and I really want to talk to you about how we bring together, or well, number one, how we do a new type of infrared spectroscopy and also how, then, how we bring that with the sister technique of RAM and how we do that simultaneously. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think I'm being... Um, over the top when I say that this, I believe, will be a new paradigm in vibrational spectroscopy. So I'm going to go straight into it. Um, I'll, I want to take you through the uh, through the current limitations as I see them uh, with respect to FTIR and Raman. I'll introduce you uh, at a fairly high level. I won't be as technical as the previous speaker uh, when it comes to how OPTIR works. Uh, and then I'll take you through a, a range of applications with, with a bit of a life science theme to it just to give you a sense of what um, something can achieve. Uh, I'm going to assume most of you know what infrared spectroscopy is, but basically it's the study of infrared light uh, with matter, and, and this excites vibrational bonds in molecules, uh, and you end up with a spectrum that is quite specific to the chemistry of what you're probing, and, and the peaks, are, and the peaks are, as I show there, are characteristic of, of the functional groups. Uh, um, and you, know, you can see lots of functional groups and, and this particular region down here can be very specific to a molecule, hence it's called often the, the fingerprint region. Uh, and it's a sort of technique that's been applied in a whole host of application areas. I and mean, that's just a, a few that I've listed in the bottom there. And, uh, you know, we, I consider this to be a workhorse technique of most analytical laboratories. Uh, but when it comes to the life scientist or the biologist in particular, you know, that, that's a particular focus of mine. Of course, it's not just biology, but that's probably most of what we do. Um, you know, it's, it's unlabeled, it's non-destructive, it's multiplexed. You can see many macromolecules at the same time, uh, and you can get some relative concentration information about them. So uh, it, it's a total, so it's really important to always remember that this is a total analysis technique. So you're measuring everything within your probe volume. Uh, and so the things that are in, in greatest abundance will be the ones that will give you the strongest signals of proteins. You'll see those very well. Uh, you'll see information about the secondary structure. Uh, you'll get information about collagen. Fibrosis studies could be uh, a great. Uh, lipids are another major macromolecule uh, class. So we can distinguish between different types of fatty acids, between phospholipids. You can look at carbon chain lengths by looking at the CH2 to CH3 ratios. You can even look at degrees of saturation. So double bonds versus single bonds. Nucleic acids, you can get some information about those as well and also carbohydrates. Uh, but it's not just limited to those macromolecules. Uh, people are now increasingly doing stable isotopic labeling of, of their samples uh, with things like heavy carbon, maybe nitrogen, deuterium, uh, or even using um, small molecular weight tags, uh, which incorporate 
things like uh, triple bonds and alkynes, nitriles. Uh, so, and, and this really is great for looking at uh, metabolites and drugs simultaneously with the overall macromolecular composition. So it's really, uh, I think, in the early days of what could be a really significant development. Right, but um, you know, infrared's been around for a while, uh, decades actually. Uh, and if we think about current infrared microscopy, uh, that's often FTIR microscopy, it's a, it's, it, the issues there are primarily limited spatial resolution because you're dealing in the long wavelengths. The resolution is limited to in the order of maybe 10-ish or the sort of mid-teens microns. Um, you know, the, the best quality spectra are always in transmission mode. But for transmission mode, you need to cut them thin and, and not everything can be cut thin. You can get uh, around some of those to some extent by doing this ATR technique, and that's the, the, the tip of the crystal there. And that means you have to have contact with your sample, um, and that has certain risks as well, cross contamination, uh, difficult in targeting, you can damage the crystal, you can damage the sample, even as an example of how the sample uh, can be damaged. Uh, but also a lot of these high-end FTI microscopes require liquid nitrogen cool detectors. Uh, that's fine if you're working during the day, but if you've got an overnight experiment or a weekend experiment, that means that some of that, you know, the poor student is going to come, going to come back in the, uh, in the early hours of the night to top up the liquid nitrogen. Uh, but I think even the biggest issues are the so-called dispersive and scatter artifacts. So you know, that, imagine that's a thin film of a polymer and we're measuring that in transmission. That would generate an ideal spectrum. It's a nice flat baseline, peaks are nice and symmetric and nice and narrow, and that's great. If you take the exact same material and make that into a sphere, a bead, the spectra look very different. Changes the size, it changes again, and so on. So it goes to show just the, the, the spectra are not just dependent on the chemistry, they're, they're worryingly um, dependent on the particle shape and size uh, and also surface roughness or surface topology. That's on the infrared side. On the Raman side, and the Raman is, is, a, um, is, a, is a sister vibrational technique. Autofluorescence has got to be the number one issue. And many samples, in particular biological samples, have significant autofluorescence that can swamp the underlying signal. Uh, people can move to longer wavelengths, uh, but then the, uh, the Raman scattering uh, diminishes significantly and you, you take a big hit in sensitivity. Uh, and that just compounds an already low sensitivity that Raman just fundamentally has. Uh, Raman must collect hyperspectral. You can't do signal frequency imaging, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, it's also sensitive to power because it's such a low sensitivity technique. You want to throw in as much power as you can, as much as can be tolerated. And you know, some samples can't tolerate. Some samples will burn. Biological cells will will, will undergo uh, phototoxicity effects. Um, and finally, there's a dependence on the excitation wavelength, whether you're working in the green, red, uh, and so on. The spectra can change, not just because of the sample and, and, and perhaps certain visible resonances, but also the substrates can have an effect. So there's a litany there of, of issues. And that's kind of where I want to introduce uh, our technique. This is the uh, optical photothermal infrared technique. Uh, it's basically a pump probe, optical spectroscopy technique where the pump is a infrared laser, typically a QCL, a quantum cascade laser. And the probe is a short wavelength laser, typically a green. That can be anything really. Uh, it generates submicron infrared spatial resolution. Uh, so it's very much like Raman in that respect, uh, but it, it generates the, the richness of the infrared, which is unique to the infrared. Uh, we generate spectra that look like they've been collected in transmission mode in an FTIR, and that's their preferred mode from a quality perspective, but we collect it in reflection mode. Uh, which is the preferred mode from a practicality perspective. And we do that without any of the distortions that are typically associated with reflection mode uh, with these traditional techniques. And it's non-contact and spatial resolution is, is wavelength independent. So how does it work? Uh, we, sh we shine a pulsed tunable infrared source, typically a QCL, um, and that's focused through a reflective Cassegrain style objective and that's focused onto the sample. And because it's a long wavelength, your diffraction and the spot's going to be relatively large, maybe in the order of 10 microns. At the same time, collinearly, we introduce a visible light, a visible probe beam, and that can be focused much more tightly, let's say down to maybe half, half a micron. Uh, and that's where primarily the spatial resolution benefit comes from. Um, and then we detect, we monitor the green signal as we tune the infrared. 
Right? And, and as the wavelength matches the absorption, as the infrared wavelength matches the absorption, the sample is heating up and cooling down, heating up and cooling. Remember that the QCL is pulsed. And so that's, that's generating that, that photothermal effect that we monitor or we detect by the green channel. Right? So we synchronously monitor the green while we sweep the infrared wavelengths and we generate what is essentially a pure infrared spectrum. Right? But because this is a QCL that can stop and park anywhere in terms of wavelength, we can take advantage of that and then do single frequency imaging. So we can, we can stop at a carbonyl peak, for example, and image only for that. We can stop at a different peak and image only for that. Right? Uh, so the, the technique operates in basically three types of modes. We can do single point, uh, sort of single point, point and shoot um, from about half micron spot size. So you can point around and it'll generate spectra at each one of those. We can work in array mode. Uh, with a minimum step of about 50 nanometers so that's oversampling but it's useful sometimes and we can do line arrays where we have uh, sort of half or we have any sort of spacing down to about 50 nanometers uh, or we can work in with 2d arrays to generate hyperspectral mapping uh, or like discovery mode whereby you generate a full stack a 3d cube of xy spatial points each with its own spectrum in, in, in wave numbers there. Um, but the other unique mode that's enabled through the use of the QCL here is a so-called uh, single frequency or single wavelength imaging mode. I also call that targeted imaging mode. It's targeted because, or well, I say it's targeted because you can think of, well, what, what might I have here? What do I know I have here? And, and you only want to image for those. So rather than imaging the full stack, you can pick out particular slices. You can pick out only some of them an image only for those. And that gives you a massive advantage in terms of speed. Uh, so in this slide here, I'm gonna compare in a bit more detail, traditional FTR microscopes and Raman microscopes uh, against a number of key attributes or, 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 or parameters really when it comes to microscopy. And primarily it's gonna be spatial resolution. So if you care about spatial resolution, you probably will be choosing Raman microscopy because Raman is so much better with um, spatial resolution than traditional IR. If you worry about fluorescence, well, you probably won't be doing Raman, you'll be doing infrared. If spectral sensitivity is, is a factor for you, then IR is, is the preferred option there, and, and that also ties into measurement speed. Um, when it comes to the extensiveness of spectral libraries, so databases or interpretability, IR uh, wins hands down. In fact, out of all of the commercial available databases, there are about 10 times more infrared spectra than there are Raman spectra. Uh, but if you want to work in reflection mode, to that easy point and shoot mode, non-contact standoff, Raman is great. Traditional IR is not. Water vapor can be a problem with IR. Raman it's not. Water solvent is an issue with IR. Again, Raman it's not. Glass substrates, uh, as you can see, and the spatial resolution independence to wavelengths. Uh, Raman is very flat. IR is a strong dependence. When you look at that, no wonder that most labs have an infrared microscope, an FTIR probably. A little Raman microscope, and depending on the needs of the experiment, you might use one or the other, or you may take it from here and then also measure it here. And then uh, there, are, there are challenges with finding the exact same, exact same spot. Uh, but what we do is we've taken the best of all of those and literally combined them into a single platform with, with OPTI and microscopy. Right? So it combines the best of traditional IR and Raman into that one platform. Uh, the sorts of modes or measurement modes uh, that we can have. Um, it's also very much a multimodal system. One can do optical, so all of the regular optical uh, variants. You can do infrared and Raman, um, which, I'll, which I'll mention and will mention. And we've also recently been adding the possibility to do wide field fluorescence as well. Uh, I think I've already mentioned that, but uh, I'm going to skip the page. Uh, in terms of pump sources, infrared pump sources, uh, the standard is, is a QCL, uh, and that covers Typically, this range of about 1800 to 950 wave numbers. Uh, we have the OPO option, addition, an, an additional laser that gives you the high wave number spectral region. But my favorites are these custom QCL options, in particular the CH region. Right, so we're now in a single device, in a single QCL box, you can have a four chip device that covers the CH region and also the bulk of the fingerprint region. Uh, but for those who are interested in, in the silent region where these triple bonds appear, uh, there's a different laser for that, or if you want to go as wide as possible, or as long as possible, 
There's also the wide uh, range QCL that goes down to about 800 wave numbers. On the probe side, which also doubles as the Raman excitation, you've got the green laser, or you've got a 785 for those uh, samples that might burn easily with the green. Uh, just to give you some examples of what the spectra look like with this new dual range CH fingerprint QCL. So I'm going to show here some spectra where I have a reference spectrum of, of FTIR and that's been collected in transmission mode on a thin, a thin sample. And then I'm going to show you the same material but collected in reflection mode of a thick block, some many millimeters. Right, so that's, that's polypropylene. So again, red is the FTIR reference. OPTIR is what we've just collected. And that you can see is a perfect match. So one's measured in transmission, one's measured in reflection. So they're a perfect match. And that's polyethylene, PET, nylon, and polystyrene. So you can see really that, that what we collect in reflection mode is completely comparable and equivalent to the databases of FTI that have been around for, for decades. Okay. I talk a lot about spatial resolution. It's something that's important to remind ourselves that spatial resolution can be approximated for Rayleigh criteria and simply uh, wavelengths uh, over NA, the numerical aperture of the objective. Uh, and for a regular FTIR instrument, your, your long wavelengths, uh, when, when you're out, out here, preclude good spatial resolution. So with, with a typical FTIR, you're probably in the order of high single digits to the to, up to the mid-teens in terms of microns of resolution. Uh, but with the OPTR technique, because we use a short wavelength green probe at 532 and high NA objective, our spatial resolution is, lo is low, which is good. We want a low number, but it's also flat, which means that at these long wavelengths, let's say the thousand wave numbers, that's at least a 30x improvement. Okay, uh, but perhaps what's exciting people the most is for the first time, uh, people are now able to collect infrared and Raman spectra from the exact same spot at the same resolution at the same time. Okay, and how that's achieved is, let me, let me take you through or walk you through this, um, this schematic here. So we start with our QCL laser uh, pumped, uh, our, our pulse tunable QCL. We shine to take that and shine it down into the objective and focus it. At the same time, we bring in our probe beam, our 532, and also focus that down. And on the sample, that's where that photophilm magic happens. The reflected light is collected back and sent on to a visible detector. So all of the detection is done in the visible. Uh, but because we're using a Raman grade uh, visible probe beam, Raman scattering is happening all the time, whether we like it or not, whether we want to use it or not, it's there. So when we, when we use a dichroic filter, we can separate out the, the, the slightly wavelength shifted Raman photons and send that to a Raman spectrometer where we can extract out the Raman signal, whereas all of the non-shifted, non-Raman scattered photons go onto the visible detector for infrared signal extraction. So doing it this way actually is, is an incredibly efficient means of generating Raman and IR from the exact same measurement. Right, so that takes it full advantage of the complementarity of IR and Raman. Remember, IR is generally more sensitive to polar bonds. Raman is more sensitive to non-polar bonds. Uh, and here, you're getting the best of both worlds. It's, a, it's, it's confirmatory, so the IR can confirm the Raman result and the Raman can confirm the IR. It's a single instrument. Uh, I think I said that already. So that's kind of the first part. I hope I'm going to be okay for time. Uh, the second part, I want to take you through some examples, just to give you a bit of a sense of uh, what you can do with this sort of tool. Right. Um, but first, I want to sort of show off a little bit, uh, like, a like a proud father here. Um, the publications are on the rise, and, and that for us is, is a really important metric because we primarily serve the academic research community. Uh, the, the best way for us to validate the worthiness or the value of this instrument is through publications. Uh, and you know, in the early days, we just as soon after we launched, uh, we had one or two publications. By the end of 2020, we had about 14. Uh, as of last count, I think we're in the mid 20s. And by the end of uh, the year, I expect to be at least over 30, and maybe if we're lucky, getting close to 40. So if you're interested, please do visit our website and uh, have a look at what people are doing in publishing. Uh, but I think one of the most important publications was one that came out maybe a year ago now. Um, that was from uh, Oksana Kementiev. And, so, and she used our technique to look at uh, neurons directly. 
and to look specifically for polymorphic amyloid aggregates in the neurons. All right, but I'm just going to show you one slide on that, but I do want to show off by, with this one, it's one of the supplementary figures, in fact. Uh, so even just separating by 282 nanometers, at each one of these points one and two, we could see clear spectral shifts. Uh, and anyone who recognizes this as the amide one will recognize that these sorts of shifts and these changes in shape are very indicative of uh, polymeric, uh, not polymeric uh, protein beta sheet, beta sheet structures. Uh, and so she was able to um, determine that there was some polymorphic uh, amyloid aggregation going on. Uh, on the polymer side, we've also done some simultaneous IR Raman work, uh, looking at some biodegradable polymers. Uh, so we've looked at a layer of PHA, and this is a cross section on PLA. And the interest here was that the interface of these two polymers should be fairly incompatible, meaning that they should delaminate and split apart, but they actually were, they were sticking really well together. So we drew uh, a line in the software, and then we collected this in simultaneous mode. So from the one measurement, we had two streams of data, one giving you infrared, one giving you RAM. And that's, that's what it looks like, it's on the screen. Uh, but if I look, if I zoom into the infrared, which for this particular sample is the more interesting one, uh, the really interesting stuff happens here in the carbonyl peak. In fact, each one of these spectra are separated by only 100 nanometers. So we did, we did spacing of 100 nanometers on that. And so you can see that uh, when, when you're measuring on the PHA side, which is on the left side, you're strong in the 725 crystalline peak. Uh, as you come across, uh, we see more of the amorphous peak from the PHA. And then as you enter the PLA uh, domain, uh, you see most of the 1740. So um, I did then uh, single frequency uh, imaging using those two peaks, 725 and 760, and that can generate some uh, nice looking images. I'll skip this one in inches of time. Um, glass contamination, glass substrate contamination, that can be a difficult thing to do for a regular FTIR instrument, but if you point and shoot on these black defects, uh, you get some nice organic peaks, all superimposed on, on a broad hump, and that broad hump is simply a glass substrate beneath coming through. Normally glass for FTIR would be completely opaque or uh, would completely distort the spectrum, uh, but with this approach, you get still useful organic information on top. And if you pick a couple of these frequencies and, and, and image only for those, you can actually see that there's some chemical heterogeneity. Uh, these are hard disk reader heads, in fact. This is from Seagate Technologies. We've got a joint publication with them. Uh, so the, some of these, let me skip quickly forward, uh, were as thin as 60 nanometers uh, and, and uh, about a micron or so in width. Uh, but they were told us they were able to use this tool to identify at least 90% with success uh, the defects that they were getting. Um, you know, microplastics and particulates are, are a really big topic at the moment and have been so for quite some time now. Uh, so, so one early measurement we did was to have a model uh, sample set up where we took 900 nanometer polystyrene beads. Um, and sprinkle them on a calcium fluoride substrate. And just measurements on the bead and off the bead, you can see on, you get what looks like polystyrene, and that's what it is, and off, you get nothing. Okay. Uh, if anyone's ever tried to measure uh, fibers in reflection mode with FTI, you know they just won't work. Uh, but what we did, we were able to take some fabric fibers, and this, uh, I believe, it was an experiment to look at fabric softener coatings. We measured along the length of a 20 micron PET fiber. You can see, and these are raw spectra, these, these aren't processed in any way. This is what you see in the software as you collect. Uh, so you can see the, the, the underlying PET shape, but over here there are some additive peaks which are actually changing along the length. But you know, whether it's a 20 micron fiber or, or an 800 nanometer fiber, it doesn't actually matter. The spectra are diameter independent, and that's something that's very, very unique to this approach. Okay, some uh, polymer phase dispersion, so I'm going to jump very quickly. These are two mixed polymers that uh, form islands, uh, one within the other. Uh, and, you know, with some of these, so, uh, for example, that image there was collected at, at 100 nanometer step size. This is a ratio image, so I actually took an image at 1733 and then an image at 1759 and ratio the two together. And if you go in there and collect single point spectra, that's what the spectra look like, and you can see uh, that these two peaks are the source of that chemical contrast. Uh, 
Uh, but if I zoom in a little bit, some of these can be really small in, in below sort of 300 nanometers in these phases. Uh, one of the really, one of the many really exciting uh, aspects and potential that comes, comes out of this technique is the idea of doing live cell imaging in water, which is something that for an IR instruments uh, would normally not be possible. Uh, so here's a cheek cell experiment I did, one of, my, one of the first measurements I did when I joined the company, in fact. So I took a, a toothpick, I swiped the inside of my cheek, put that down on a calcium fluoride substrate, a drop of water, calcium fluoride cover slip on top, and I just pushed down gently to push out the excess water. And then when I did some single point spectra, and I, actually I forgot to do uh, a visible picture being early on the job. Um, this is the sort of spectra I was, I was getting. And quickly I could see that well, some of them had clear lipid peaks, protein is everywhere, and some of them had nucleic acid peaks. So I said, all right, let's do a single frequency image at those three, and then we'll create an, an RGB overlay. And when we did that, I thought, well, wow, this looks like a fluorescence image, but it's all done in the infrared, it's all done in water. So we can see uh, our, our lipid inclusions, we can see that nucleic acid, not surprisingly, is mostly in the nucleus. Uh, but again, in the infrared, where normally the resolution would be 10 to 20 microns, we're now getting sub-micron resolution. Um, these are some breast tissues uh, that came to us. Uh, they were interested in looking at breast tissue calcifications, and they, these have been measured with an FTIR microscope already. So they had a rough idea of where the calcifications were, and we came here, and they, we, we, we took a few spectra, and you know, the, the initial spectra, I wasn't seeing much calcification. So I said, all right, let's, let's do something differently. Let's start with the imaging. Let's tune the QCL to the peak of the calcification. It will, it will image only for the calcification. And when you did, wow, that's what we saw. That just blew uh, their minds because the, the calcifications are, are highly dispersed. And they're highly um, localized uh, and they're not anywhere near as diffusely spread as, as they thought from the FTIR. So if you, if you look at the spectra on, on and off these hotspots, on these hotspots, you've got, for example, this, this bottom red one here is a massive calcification peak relative to the protein. In between, you've got no calcification. So that all makes sense. Uh, it turns out that the average size of these calcifications are about five microns, and some of them are even less than a micron. Now, if you think about it, at, at 1050 wave numbers, that's about, that's almost 10 microns of light. At 10 microns of light with a normal FTIR far-field instrument, your spatial resolution is going to be in the order of 10 microns as well. So it's not surprising that, that when they measured this with an FTIR system, what they saw was a, was a more diffuse, the um, distributed calcifications rather than these highly localized ones. So this was a big revelation. In fact, you know, we took that further and did some particle analysis on this. And, and, and the thinking is that, that in the, the, the shape and the, and the number of, and the size of these particles of these calcifications may also have some clue towards uh, how, how these breast cancers develop and how micro calcifications play a role. So that's, that's a paper in pro progress, shall we say. Uh, I'll skip that one for now. This was a cool example because we really did a stress test. We took polystyrene beads of 900 nanometers, two microns, four and a half and 10 microns, and then threw in a PMMA uh, be that three microns and we did this in salt water and then deposited this onto a calcium fluoride. So when, when the water dries off, you're left with salt crystals, and you're left with a mixture of polymer beads of various sizes and various chemistries. Uh, and if anyone's done any infrared, you'll know that any measurements in the vicinity of crystals, salt crystals, will completely ruin your spectra. You'll get all sorts of crazy scatter artifacts and it won't work. Uh, but what happens here with us is that the crystals have no, no impact, basically. Uh, so in blue, we've got various PMA spectra. In the sort of orangey reddish tones, we've got uh, the different, differently sized polystyrene spectra. So again, spectra consistent regardless of particle size or shape. Uh, and then in this case, it's a fairly easy binary mixture. So we can take these two frequencies, we can image only for those, and only those particles light up. Uh, the crystals, the salt crystals, sodium chloride, don't light up because they don't absorb at that frequency. The only time you get a photosynthetic response is, you have, if you, is if you have a, a, an absorbance, not if you have a scattering event, which is what the crystals will do. Um, I'll skip that one. 
skip that one. These are just some real world um, microplastics that have been filtered onto gold coat polycarbonate filters. So we've got infrared spectra, Raman spectra, all collected simultaneously. We can search them simultaneously. You can see infrared is excellent, the Raman is excellent, they're both clearly polycarbonate. That just gives you a lot more confidence that uh, what, you, what you think it is, is actually what you think it is. Uh, this, was a, this was a really great paper by Andrew Alt from Michigan. He looked at atmospheric particles. He measured that with infrared and Raman. Um, just to give you some examples uh, of the infrared spectra, the Raman spectra. These are all, of course, collected simultaneously. Uh, quickly slip through that. Uh, the paper here by Kathy Goff looking at collagen orientation. Um, and she, she took advantage of the polarized nature of the infrared QCL uh, laser. It's highly, highly linearly, linearly polarized. So when there's structure and orientation in your sample, as is in the case of the stretched uh, collagen fibrils and fibers, you get to see that uh, in the spectrum. So in this case, you can see when we have the polarization at one angle, at one, uh, say, parallel, your amide one and amide two ratios change drastically. Right, I'm just going through this pretty quickly. Uh, it also means that with, with the IPTR technique, we can actually use glass as a substrate. If anyone here has done infrared um, work before with biological materials, you know that nearly always you will be you are working on an infrared transparent substrate because glass is opaque for the infrared, for the, for the majority of the infrared. But with this technique, glass now becomes a viable uh, tool. This is another paper that's in review at the moment. Uh, where we looked at uh, differentiating two different cancerous cell lines to a non-cancerous cell line based purely on the chemistry as determined by uh, PTIR. Again, this was on glass. Uh, and these are, just to give you a, a sense on the quality of the spectra, these are single scans. So this is about one second measurement per point, And this is what you get. So this is using this new CHQCL. So you get all of the regular biological information, CH, amide one amide 2 and you also get the glass hump as well. This is this was a thin single cell. If this was a thick tissue, say several microns and above, you wouldn't see any glass. Right? Uh, but I, took, I did that, took a little bit further and looked at um, chain length. Maybe I mentioned earlier that we can do chain length. So if you take the CH2 to CH3 ratio, the image then, the contrast in the image is then based on chain length, uh, which can be quite telling and, um, and, and lipids to protein ratios as well, that can give you an idea. So I think we've already seen some nuclear membrane, maybe some cellular membranes lighting up. This might be the second last example. This is a recent publication by Peter Gardner from Manchester looking at live cells in water. Uh, and normally FTIR is as I thought to be uh, impossible or difficult uh, because of the need for these very short path things. But OPTIR fundamentally has a very low water background. So this really opens up the idea of doing unlabeled imaging with Raman and, and simultaneous with unlabeled with IR and simultaneous with Raman. Right. Uh, the trick to really making this work well and make, making this work well is to do this upside down sandwich approach. Uh, is to put the cell on the top window and have it basically hanging upside down. Because the, the infrared light comes from the top. You want the infrared lights to interact with the cell first and not with the water. That would that may be sitting on top if it was flipped around. But so interact with the with the cell. And then the, that photothermal magic happens and the green probe beam is free to pass through the water. The water is fine for the green. So we measure, in this mode, we actually measure in transmission. It's one of the few times we measure in transmission. All right, so some fixed cell examples, some live cell examples. Uh, this is probably the last one, I think, is bacteria. So uh, Liv uh, Roy Goodacre from University of Liverpool looked at using, um, isotopically labeled bacteria so that these bacteria have been fed carbon-13 sources, nitrogen-15 sources, uh, and this has a profound impact on the amide-1 and amide-2p. So normally this is what the spectrum would look like, but if you feed them carbon-13, there's a massive shift in the amide-1. Carbon-15, there's a moderate shift in the amide-2, and from this you can really work out a lot about the metabolism of bacteria. And previously, with a regular FTR instrument, you could not target individual cells, only large clumps of cells. Uh, you, you could target them with Raman, of course, but Raman isn't very sensitive to protein. So here we've got the single cell resolution, and we've got the, sensit the sensitivity and specificity for proteins. 
Okay, so this is something that I've collected on one of their samples uh, using this time the, uh, the this, this silent region QCL. Uh, but you know, here's, this is actually an image of a single bacterium. Like this, you know, 20 years ago when I started on FTI, this, this would be just mind boggling. Uh, but now we're actually seeing in the far field, like we're using a regular optical microscope, we can get chemical information about uh, each, each, each and individual bacteria, and even within the bacteria to some extent. So I've collected four spectra along the length, uh, and there are some subtle differences, uh, even, even on the top there in the on the one. Um, and, and here's some example of Raman and IR of a single bacterial measurement. These are about 20 second measurements. In fact, nowadays I do that in about 10 seconds. Uh, and I think that brings me to the end. So to finish up, and what I would hope that you would take away and remember from this is that by, with, with OPTR, we, we're going beyond all of these accepted and, and, and known limits of IR, going beyond them, bringing IR and RAM into a single platform. It's sub-micron, right, so we see a lot more detail. It's non-contact, there's no cross-contamination. There are no dispersive scatter artifacts, which can be a real problem with many traditional instruments used in biological research. Uh, there's little to no cell preparation. Uh, these new Q-cells are opening up new spectral ranges, therefore new possibilities. Uh, and as I, as I hinted on earlier as well, um, we've now got the possibility to, to add fluorescence modules on top. And when you add a fluorescence module on top, not only can you be guided by the visible image, you can now let the fluorescence image, so you can actually tag your samples, use your fluorescence image to guide you as to where you want your chemistry from. Um, and that way you get the best of both worlds. You get the specificity that fluorescence gives you and you get the, the overall chemical uh, information that, that the infrared gives you. Okay. Finally, IR plus Raman, same spot, same time, same resolution. Hopefully that wasn't too fast and I've got a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa, for the introduction to the Mirage. At, uh, and um, maybe there are questions around um, directly to the manufacturer. Uh, that's the chance you now have. Okay, I have a very quick question, but um, general technical questions. So what your uh, thought about comparison between FTIR and uh, your photothermal IR spectroscopy in terms of expensiveness and the complexity of the setup. And, and if, if one wants to build the setup in their own lab, and do you see, is it much more complex to do it? And what's your thought on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, naturally, FTIR has been around for decades now, really, or probably two to three decades now. So, the complexity of those instruments uh, are not like they used to be. Um, OPTIR is a relatively new technique still. So anyone doing this in their own lab, and there's, and there's a few groups in the world who are uh, building their own instruments. I think you, you had Professor Cheng a few weeks ago, and he's one of them. In fact, he's one of the co-inventors of this technique and that we've commercialized. Uh, so by you know, building it, of course, there's a lot of complexity there. Uh, but of course, if you buy a ready-built commercial system, it's it's all under the box. I mean, if you, if you were to look under the hood there, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, but when it's all packaged up, uh, that complexity from a user perspective um, is no longer a consideration. Uh, and from a usage point of view, uh, I didn't say this during the talk, but from a, a workflow perspective, uh, this, this system operates much more like a Raman microscope in terms of how you use it, uh, with the key difference that it gives you infrared information and Raman as well if you want it. So from a user perspective, using a commercial instrument, uh, the complexity isn't there. It's all kind of under the hood. Uh, that's you know, what we did and what we sort of um, perfected the art of is to remove the complexity for the user and make it uh, a lot more simple. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, then maybe I have... Uh, for two questions, I, um, as far as I guess, I would think that the, the laser sources are the most expensive part in the microscope at the end. Is there any hope to, to get cheaper parts there, which will drop if you, the... If you have any ideas, Frank, please do let me know. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> these QCLs, as you probably know very well, um, are not so cheap. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, this, this has a, has a, has a flow-on effect um, to, to the overall instrument price. But if you um, consider where these QCLs were five years ago in terms of price, uh, and tunability and performance and, and reliability, uh, it's early days yet. So there's no doubt that we're in the beginning of, of, a, of a, almost a revolution when it comes to how infrared is done. Okay. So the QCLs will get cheaper, they'll get better, they'll get faster, they'll get, they'll get wider. Uh, and as they do, we will ride that and we will you know, reap the rewards from that. Okay. So uh, the other question is more um, an application side or uh, that I could have asked also to the other people presenting already about infrared spectroscopy. So if you, if you do that, um, as you showed at the end in, uh, uh, on live cells in water, at, um, uh, you have a, a, a larger area which you illuminate and where you also have water absorption. Is there any kind of special trick you have to, um, to, um, to do or to follow um, to uh, not heat up your sample uh, while imaging? You know, in, in, in water, it's actually not so much of an issue with heating. Uh, the water is actually pretty good at dissipating the heat. Uh, if you're working with a solid sample, uh, you've got an infrared laser, you've got a probe laser. So like with Raman, uh, if you're not careful, you, you certainly can damage or burn a sample. That's why you know, before I do any serious measurement, I'll go off to a little corner of the sample and I'll, I'll just work out my damage thresholds. Okay. Um, and then I'll take it down a notch yeah. and then I'll measure in, 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 at levels that I'm comfortable won't damage the sample. But uh, in water, it's probably the easiest because the, the, the heat just dissipates very quickly. Okay. Other questions? Well, we still have the chance. Okay, just a quick question. So about the fluorescence, yeah. So do you use the probe laser as an excitation laser for your fluorescence or, or you, you plan no, to so use additional lasers? Actually, I'm glad you Steve, mentioned that. I, I keep feeling to say this, and it's one of the most important things to say is, separate, separate to your question though, is with fluorescence, you know, Raman can suffer from fluorescence. And if there's fluorescence in your sample, the Raman channel measurement will still see fluorescence the infrared channel will not. So the infrared is completely immune to fluorescence, even though we're using a green probe beam for the detection, because it's because we're, we're demodulating that modulated, the, 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 the modulated signal, the fluorescence isn't an issue. But to your question specifically about what's the source for the fluorescence for the MPE wide field fluorescence, uh, we're not doing this in a confocal laser scanning mode. We're doing this with, with a, an LED um, excitation. Though theoretically that, that is possible as well. Okay, thanks. Okay. So if there are no more questions, Mustafa, then uh, thank you very much again for that presentation. Thank you. Very um, uh, let me thank also uh, Vahid again, who has left already, certainly he's uh, rather busy. And uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, today, we hope to get you back uh, on next Wednesday, the June 16th, because we have two exciting speakers there as well. Uh, the first one will be Gregory Hartland uh, from the University of Notre Dame. And the second one will be uh, Takayoshi Kobayashi uh, from uh, 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 the University in Taiwan, uh, both presenting uh, on different topics. So I uh, hope you join us at uh, that time again, same time, uh, in case you want to watch the presentations again, there's our YouTube channel and we meanwhile have already a very nice list of publications related to photothermal microscopy and spectroscopy and the surroundings we have as topics here in that um, kind of webinar on our website. So if you're interested in that, uh, please also go ahead and um, have a look at that. And probably the last word is uh, the word of surpasses or for today. I think that's all. You have done a good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if surpasses says uh, uh, it's over, then uh, thank you very much for joining us. See you next week. <laughs>